At the top of the mountain, there is a large hut that appeared to be constructed of black bones. As we approached it, Hanky and Hattie started freaking out for the first time since we entered this strange and horrible world. You are here to meet the professor, four visitors at a time, announced the guard, 759. He half lifted his gun and used it to point at a woman who was near the front of the group. You, he said. Then he selected three more people. You, you, and you. You may enter now. You may become enlightened now. The four people looked at each other nervously. They were obviously hesitant to enter that black bone hut, and I didn't blame them. It seemed somehow like death himself was in there, waiting to swallow us up. Hattie let out a particularly mournful yell as the dark clouds above continued to spit out endless bolts of lightning. Now, said 759, lifting his gun fully. As with everything else since this nightmare began, we didn't seem to have much of a choice. Follow orders or be murdered. One of the four walked up to the hut and pulled back the red curtain that served as its entrance. He stepped in and the others followed. They were in there for a while, maybe an hour. We sat outside waiting for our turn. It was the longest amount of time we had been still since stepping through the black hole. We sat in exhausted silence at first, while Hanky and Hattie hissed and cried. Then we started talking to people, for the first time really. Lauren turned to the woman sitting next to her on a black rock. I'm Lauren, she said. What's your name? Amelia, said the woman in a tired voice. Why do they keep calling you the Gatherer? Laura shrugged. No idea. What do they call you? 802, said Amelia. Though why, or how, or what this place is, or what is going on, I have no fucking idea. Like, why are there cats just wandering around here? What are those weird plants? What is this place? I'm as lost as you, said Laura. But I think we're about to find out. As she said this, the curtain opened, and the four people who had gone in stepped out. They had wide smiles plastered all over their faces, and looked very relaxed, the total opposite of how they looked going in. 759 selected four more people, including Amelia, and we sat waiting for our turn. We tried to get some answers out of the people who had already gone in, but they weren't saying much. Everything's gonna be fine was all they'd say. You'll see. I tried to get our cats to calm down so maybe I could take advantage of the wait time to get some internet reception. But they were both backed up against rocks with their tails straight up and their fur on end, bearing their claws and swiping at anyone who got near, including me. We made some more small talk with the people around us, but nobody knew anything more than we did. Eventually, we settled back into silence. I sat there with Laura's head on my lap, waiting. We were so exhausted, but the weird drink they had given us won't let us go to sleep. From inside the hut, I heard a scream. Laura bolted upright, and we all stared at the red curtain with wide, terrified eyes. Finally, the curtain opened, but this time only three people stepped out. Like the others who had come before, they seemed perfectly happy with life, but they were one short of the four who had entered. Then it was our turn. 759 pointed to me, then Lauren, then two others. You ready? Lauren asked. No, but I don't think we have a choice, I said. I went in first. I pulled back the curtain and stepped in. I was instantly overwhelmed by uncomprehending terror. The first thing that I noticed, because it was the only thing moving, was one of those horrible creatures of snake and bone with a shimmering ghost head crouched in a corner. It was tearing into a human body, the guy before us who hadn't made it out. A spray of blood and body parts splattered against the bone walls of the hut. Next, my eyes moved to a large machine sitting on the table. It had all sorts of levers attached to it and was making a constant whirring sound which could barely be heard above the wet noises of the monster ripping apart the corpse. There were several wires coming from the machine, and I followed them with my eyes. 
They run up and then over to where four people were sitting, strapped to chairs. They were sitting motionless, only occasionally blinking wide open eyes. The wires ran into their heads and then back out of them. On the floor next to the chairs was a cat carrier. Inside was a cat, apparently sleeping peacefully with the wire also running into and out of its head. The wires ultimately led to a man sitting cross-legged in another corner of the room. He had shock white hair, was wearing large eyeglasses, and the wires terminated in his head. His eyes were closed. Then he opened them, looked straight at me, and said, Hey there, chief. Been waiting for you. Once we were all inside, the professor began. Fifteen years ago, I discovered a portal from the new world to this world that you find yourselves in now. And make no mistake, Earth is young. It has only been there for 4.5 billion years, and it will not last much longer. This place, this wonderful place, where everything is possible, has been around for considerably longer, and will be around for as long as we sustain it, and harness its energies. Earth was never really suited for us. We were always destined to destroy it, but this world, it thrives on us. It needs us, and for too long, we have neglected it. Fifteen years ago, this world was quite different. It has been dying rapidly. That's why you're here. We we're going to save it, and we we're going to save all of the people on Earth. Or most of them, anyway. When I first stepped through the portal, the wormhole, I was overwhelmed by this world's energies. I was transformed instantly, and my mission became clear. I had to save everyone and everything that matters. So I went back to the new world to get started, but I wasn't ready. Everything was still too raw. I couldn't control the new energies inside of me, and things didn't go well. I slaughtered some Harvard students, and my body was riddled with bullets when the police found me. But I didn't die. I just came back here. Upon my return here, I knew that I needed to take my time and devise a plan. That is what I have been working on for the past 15 years, and that is where you all come in. But before I tell you what that plan is and what you'll each be doing, I want to show you why we're doing this. The professor reached up and pulled one of the wires out of his head. There was a sharp needle attached to the end. Stick this in your head, he said. Each of you, don't worry, it won't hurt, and it will go in easily. And what you'll see next is what this world once was and will be again with your hard work. None of us in the room were eager to jam a wire into our heads, but I got motivated when I looked back over to the corner where the snake bone monster was. It had finished its work and was now standing up over a puddle of blood and pulp, presumably watching us. Okay, I said. I walked up to the professor, took the wire, and jammed it into my head. I felt warmth rush over me, and a mounting feeling of deep peace, and even deeper joy. Everything was alright. Everything was always going to be alright. Forever. I looked around. I was in the middle of a green field. Up ahead was a massive waterfall, with a rainbow appearing in its mist. Then I heard them, children laughing in pure delight. I turned around and saw hundreds of people in the field then, all smiling and playing and holding hands. Behind the people was a grove of trees ripe with bright, colorful fruit. Then I was lifting off the ground, like I was flying, getting higher and higher. I felt someone squeeze my hand and looked over to see Lauren. She was smiling in the sunlight looking dropped at gorgeous, it kept rising, and I looked down. I could see the whole world. It was full of beautiful landscapes, and somehow, I could see the people there too, although they should have looked like specks of dust. They were all so happy. There's no misery there, no poverty, no starvation, no strife, no murder. Everything was good and easy. 
Everything was provided for, everyone loved each other. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen or felt. It was perfect in a way that's beyond description. Suddenly, I was standing back in the bone hut, staring at the professor. He had pulled the wire out of my head. Pretty good, huh, chief? He asked. Then he pulled the wires out of Lorne and the two others. We can have that again, said the professor, and we can bring everyone from Earth here so that they are not stuck on a doomed planet. We can make a new home that will last as long as we sustain it. How? I asked. You are the gardener, said the professor. Those red plants you see every now and then, those are what give the world its energies. We need more of them, and you are going to tend to them. I have never planted anything in my life, I said. I don't know anything about it. Oh, you're underselling yourself, said the professor. Your hands, they're glowing green. You can't see that? No, of course not. You're not ready. But you'll know what to do. And you already have plenty of work to do. By my count, there are already 23 human hearts here to plant. The professor looked over to the corner where the monster had torn apart the man. Oh, my mistake, 24. Outside, we heard a sudden burst of gunfire. Make that 32, said the professor. I struggled to grasp just what was going on. It was overwhelming, all of it. The plants are human hearts, I asked, torn between horror and amazement. Now you got it, chief, said the professor, smiling. And the better, more virtuous the person, the more energy that her heart plant will release into the world. The professor turned to the woman who came in with us. Your heart glows gold, my dear. That is why you're the judge. You will travel to the new world and find the purest hearts for the gardener to plant. Next, he turned to Lorne. And you, with the silver tongue, you're a master of persuasion. Well, he was right about that, I thought, looking down at the pink flowers on the shirt I was wearing, which she had picked out for me. You are the gatherer. You must also return to the new world and convince these people, the ones whose hearts we need, to gather at certain places at certain times. Their hearts must enter this world still beating for this to work. The professor turned to the other man in our group before, and you, you are the engineer. Your brain flashes with electric energy. You will help me work out some technical issues I've encountered. Our goal is ultimately to be able to control when and where the wormholes open. I achieved that once, 15 years ago. But that was when this world had far more energy. So you didn't cause the wormhole to open up? Asked the engineer. The one that brought us here? No said the professor. I was given advanced warning of it due to energy spikes coming from the new world. That's why I send my agents in that world to set up blockades. But why us? asked Lorne. I know we have glowing body parts or whatever, but how did you know that? How did you know that we'd be there? The professor shrugged. I didn't. But once you were there, I could detect your energies. I knew your names. I have means of communicating with the new world. He pointed first to the cat in the crate, and then to the giant whirring machine. It is powerful, but imperfect. That is one thing that the engineer will help me with. At any rate, once I realized that there would be a mass of people within range of the wormhole, I decided that now would be a good time for serious recruitment. And the others? asked the judge the ones who got crushed in their cars. Some were brought to be soldiers, some were brought to be plants, and you all were brought to serve your purposes, but some have no purpose whatsoever. Initially, there will be some unfortunate sacrifices, but once we have this world back to where it was, and once we can control the wormholes, we will bring everybody here. It will be paradise. You've seen it yourselves now. You know it's true. I've got a question, I said. What is it, chief? 
What's the deal with the cats here? The professor shrugged. They've been here forever, for many billions of years. At some point, a few wandered into a natural wormhole, and so now they are in both places, the new world and this one. They are very useful. They are a link between worlds. Now, if there are no more questions, it is almost time to get to work. You've had a long journey, so for the remainder of the day, you will rest. Tomorrow evening, a small wormhole will briefly open, allowing the gatherer and the judge to return to the new world and begin their work. I believe that you will land somewhere in the Midwest USA, though it should be clearer where exactly as we get nearer. The gardener and the engineer will stay here with me and begin their work. That is, assuming that nobody objects to their assigned roles. I took another look at the puddle in the corner. No, I said, we're good. Once we were outside again, the guards led us past the bodies that they had gunned down and over the peak of the mountain. There, on the other side, was a large plateau that held an incredible oasis. All around it were the same black rocks and dreary landscapes. Then, encircled by a ring of those red hard plants, were lush green fields and sparkling ponds. I could see trees overflowing with fruit. A small break in the clouds allowed the sun to shine through onto that one spot. As soon as we were away from the bone hut, Hanky and Hattie settled back down. We walked as a group to the oasis, where several huts were waiting for us. These ones weren't made of those black bones. Soon, said 759, waving his hand in front of him, the whole world will be like this. All will enjoy it. For now, we will enjoy it ourselves. Go and rest. As soon as I stepped into the oasis, as though walking through some invisible barrier, I felt a rush of warmth through my body. It wasn't the pure joy that I had felt before when I had the wires stuck in my head. But it was a taste of that. I felt completely at peace. Lorne and I found an empty hut and settled in with Hanky and Hattie. It was the first time we were alone together since this started. I was feeling, uh, really aroused. I made my move, leaning in for a kiss. Lorne pushed me away. This is wrong, she said. Not in the mood, I asked, disappointed. That's okay, we can rest first. I am in the mood, said Lorne, and that's part of what's so wrong about it. I feel so good, but I shouldn't. Not after everything that's happened. Babe, all of those people crushed like fucking ants in their cars. That one guy fed to the monster, those people gunned down outside the hut, and now we're supposed to go around collecting fucking human hearts to grow into fucking heart plants? This is wrong. All this is just so, so wrong. I felt a twitch of bad feeling, trying to fight its way into me. But we can bring everyone here, eventually, I said. I'm not so sure about that, said Lorne. I'm not so sure the professor is telling us the whole truth. Remember the way Hanky and Hattie were freaking out as soon as we got within 50 feet of him? We should take that as a warning. They know things that we don't. But we're here now, in this paradise, I said. You can feel it, right? You can see it? We can make the whole world like this, and even better. You saw what I saw there in the professor's hut. You know what it would be like. Even if it is true, said Lorne, how many people do we have to kill to make it happen? Good people, too. The more virtuous, the better, the professor said. How many heart plants will it take? He never said. One thousand? A million? A billion? All of the time? And how many will get to enjoy this new world if that's really what will happen? I just... It's wrong. All around. This isn't how things are supposed to be. I know that you can feel it. I could. It's what I had been feeling all along. Until I stepped into the oasis when the voice inside me died and the warmth replaced it, I concentrated. Okay, I said. What do we do? If we don't follow orders, the professor will have us killed. 
one way or another, and they'll go on without us anyway. Lorne reached down and gave Hattie a scratch under her chin. Then we'll have to kill the professor, she said. Does anybody have any ideas on how we can do that? Because I see zero chance of that happening, and I'm scared as hell about it. But I know we have to try, and I feel like we only have until tomorrow, when the wormhole opens and Lorne is supposed to go through while I stay here. God, I'm scared.